Good afternoon and welcome to the February 21st meeting of the Board's Strategic Planning Committee. We're really excited about the topic we have for the agenda today. We're going to be discussing students' social emotional well-being. As you know, that's been at the forefront of all of our discussions recently because our students have to be in a mindset in order to receive the academics that we're trying to provide for them. Today, we're going to explore some indicators that are proxies for student well-being. As we discuss today's presentation, I ask my colleagues to consider what are the salient points that warrant a discussion with the full board. At this time, I'm going to ask my colleagues to go around and introduce themselves. Arvin, are you on? I know Arvin is planning to join us virtually today. He's not there yet, so I'll start with Ms. Harris. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Lynn Harris. And I'm Brenda Wolf. Does anybody have any concerns about the informational summary? Okay, so at this time, I'm going to ask Ms. Sharon to get started. Do you want to introduce uh, Mr. Kim? I think oh, he's got are, on. Oh, Arvin, are you there? I can't see you. There you are. How you doing? Arvin, go ahead and introduce yourself. Okay. I think he, are you on mute? Okay, well, well, we'll just come back, all right? All right, Ms. Sharon, would, would you like to get started? Yes, absolutely. Can we pull the slide deck up, please? Thank you. Um, so again, my name is Stephanie Sharon. I'm the Chief of Strategic Initiatives. Happy to be here today. And with me, I have uh, Steve Neff, our Director of Pupil Personnel Services, as well as Carla Lopez Arias, who is our Supervisor for our Department of Student Engagement, Behavioral Health, and Academics, who will be presenting on this very important topic today. So again, our focus today is, is going to be in the Strategic Planning uh, Priority Area Number 2, which is well-being and family engagement. And particularly, our focus is going to be on the disproportionality in suspension and chronic absenteeism. If we can go to the next slide, please. So as you can see, um, that is the objective that we are focusing on within our strategic plan. And in very small <laughs> letters um, on the bottom, is you, we wanted to highlight or circle for you the specific metric within the strategic plan that we are focusing on. And that is the percent of out-of-school suspensions for disrespect, disruption, and insubordination for black or African-American and Hispanic Latino students. That is one of our metrics. Um, in our strategic plan that we have been monitoring as part of the overall, as Ms. Wolf said earlier, um, well-being and family engagement. And in addition to talking about that metric, we're also talking about something else today, uh, which is chronic absenteeism. For those of you that tuned into the board meeting on February 7th, we had a robust conversation around the social, emotional um, well-being of our students and what we were doing. And one of the things that came out of that conversation was discussed discussion about attendance and specifically about chronic absenteeism because as you will see in this presentation similarly to the disproportionality that we see in out-of-school suspension we also see that in our chronic absenteeism as well so we're coupling those two together because they often go hand in hand when we think about the impact of well-being on our students so if we can go to the next slide so these are two questions that we are focusing our presentation on today. So as we were planning this presentation uh, for the committee and engaging in discussion, these were the this was the frame with which we wanted to look at at and have this conversation. First, what are we intentionally doing? to reduce disproportionality in suspensions and referrals for our black and Latino students? And what are we intentionally doing to 
to reduce those chronic absenteeism rates as well. And I want to highlight the term um, inten intentional because as you will see, um, although our suspension rates overall have gone down significantly for all students, including black and Latino students in some instances, the disproportionality has not changed. So think about that for a second. We're seeing a reduction in the suspensions, but we're not seeing a change in the disproportionality. So we're still seeing almost 80% of our um, suspensions are among our black and Latino students. And this is also similarly uh, what we see with chronic absenteeism. And um, the committee that worked, which many of them are in the audience as well as at the table, we really engaged in some very robust conversations around the why behind this and the complexities around addressing disproportionality, not just on the individual student level, but what we need to do systemically to really create a change in what our data is saying to us. Um, so it was, it was, uh, um, like I said, a very robust conversation that really challenged all of our thinking as we were really trying to be strategic in how we were presenting and thinking about the exact actions that we were taking and where we need to go next. Um, next slide. So to kick us off, I just want to take a little trip down memory lane. Um, as we know, we implemented the anti-racist system audit, and we actually conducted the audit as a result of all the disproportionality that we saw across the board in academics, chronic absenteeism, as well as uh, sus uh, suspension rates. And the audit report suggested that MCPS already follows many best practices um, and has comprehensive policies that work towards addressing racial equity. However, and I quote, and we quote this a lot as we've been working on unpacking the anti-racist audit and action planning accordingly, the application of these best practices differ greatly across the district, suggesting that the system is currently fragmented. And that is a quote directly from the anti-racist audit report. And that this fragmentation is a barrier to us reducing disproportionality and having um, an equitable system across the board. So when we think about um, what we are trying to do as a result of the anti-racist audit, and that will be presented in May as a little bit of a teaser around what our action plan is to the full board, um, one of the things that we are really trying to address is that fractured system um, and, and the application that currently lacks a lot of coherence. So what you see up on this screen is just a reminder of the five cross-domain recommendations that were made as a result of the audit. And since the report has come out, we have been working hard to address these recommendations. Because if we really engage coherence, accountability for racial equity work, equity-centered capacity building, continuous data collection, and relational trust, and we abide by that framework, we should be able to effectively address disproportionality across the system, not just in some areas. Um, we've already been starting this work. We've had two full-day work sessions with all central office leaders um, and school School base leaders will be attending multi-day training sessions specifically um, designed to address these five areas starting in February. Um, so we are, and we believe that this work will have a direct impact on reducing our disproportionality. Last, uh, next slide, excuse me. Lastly, I just want to share again that the systemic racism framework that we have been utilizing as a district to illustrate how we are analyzing the barriers and developing action steps as we move forward. Um, this framework organizes the barriers into four critical areas, individual, interpersonal, institutional, and structural racism. Um, we frequently see that issues are focused on addressing the individual aspect of systemic racism, but as our data has shown and the data that you are even going to see today, these are systemic issues which we need to address at the institutional level. And this means that we need to do a better job of developing strategies that cross different levels of the school district and across all spaces. 
But as you will see, issues like suspension and chronic absenteeism are also impacted by factors outside of the school's control. So this also means that we have to strategically work with and coordinate and collaborate with our partners outside of just MCPS to really have a significant impact. So I am um, very excited to uh, present today with you all um, on, on these two topics. And at this time, I am going to turn it over to Carla, who's going to present on the suspensions. When she's done, we'll have an opportunity to have discussion. And then um, Steve will present on chronic absenteeism, and we'll have, again, another discussion after that. So I'll pass it over to Carla. Thank you. Good afternoon. So before we start to discuss disproportionate suspensions in the discretionary categories, it is important to note changes that have occurred in recent years. Well, insubordination is a standalone code in the, in the synergy referral system. It, oh, I'm sorry. Next slide. <laughs> it is not a standalone code for the Maryland suspensions. So to provide context for our conversation, please note the following. Insubordination is now under this uh, under disrespect and disrespect only rises to a level three of behavioral intervention or consequences in the student code of conduct therefore it is not el eligible for an out of school suspension disruption may rise to a level five next slide please suspensions for disrespect and disruption have doubled this school year we will discuss several contributing factors and efforts to reduce exclusionary practices for students who provided targeted interventions and support. It is important to note that, as discussed on the previous slide, that disrespect is not eligible for an out of school suspension. The 60 ineligible suspensions for disrespect occurred at 18 schools. And you have them circled on the top. For the current school year, 22 students have been suspended multiple times for disruption. These 22 students account for 44 suspensions for disruption. Seven students have been suspended multiple times for disrespect. These students account for 15 suspensions under this code. So there are students who have been suspended multiple times under the same code. Next slide, please. In reviewing our current 222 incidents where disruption was listed as the primary suspension code, these are the trends that have emerged. As you can see, um, when a school enters a suspension, usually there is a description that goes along with what is the suspension for. You know, I'm wondering, and I, and I want to ask my colleague here, because it's quite a while before you get to a discussion point, if we might want to have a few breaks before then, because, I mean, I have questions already, and I, I'm sure that Ms. Harris does too. And so before you go on, I would like to ask you a question. This, um, you mentioned that 22 of the students account for 44 suspensions. Well, I, I don't understand that. I mean, I, I know what the number says, mm -hmm. but I don't know why a student would keep getting suspended for the same offense if we're applying restorative justice practices. To me, there's some kind of disconnect in here. What are we not doing or not learning from these situations that the same child would keep getting suspended for the same thing? And although we do have policies, right, and restorative justice is something that we use as a county, we know that the variability that it is utilized in schools, it changes, right? And that's something that the anti-racist audit has pointed out to us plainly in the report, that the, the level of, that they are using some of these practices varies within school to school, so that's why. I, I hear what you're saying, but I don't even, I mean, disrespect, what is disrespect? Is that, you know, don't look at me, you know, kind of thing? Because to me, respect is a relational issue that you are having with your with a child and so I'm not understanding understanding some of that. I don't know if Ms. Harris has a a question about this. And to be honest, that's the conversation that my director and I had as we looked at this data, right? What is this respect that is very, you know, subjective to how you see it, to your experience, to how you show up to a space? Mm -hmm. And there's that cultural difference as to what is disrespectful in one person versus another. Well, that's exactly my point. So yeah. if, if you just tell me disrespect, what is that looking like from school to school? Is, is one child at this school being suspended or whatever for disrespect 
and the same infraction at another school has resulted in different treatment? That's what I'm trying to figure out, because this data is not telling me a story that, that um, I like. <laughs> okay. So I don't know if you can address that, and maybe it's going to be addressed later on, and if it is, feel free to say so. But um, I believe it will be addressed later on as we go through, you know, what's next. Okay. Ms. Harris? And I just had a couple clarifying questions. Mm -hmm. um, so looking at slide seven, um, the uh, 22 students equal 44 suspensions for disruption. Are we seeing commonality? So first of all, are these all students at the same grade level, or are we seeing multiple grade levels? This is mostly secondary, middle school and high school. Okay. So there is, um, there is some commonality as to, let's say, we have a school that may have two incidents where three kids were suspended multiple times. Okay. So we, we may have some of those cases. Um, and you will see that there is correlation to the work with this proportionality that lives in the special education office, which is going to be linked later in the presentation. Yeah, because that, that I think would be a concern. Yes. That I, our question I would have is what schools are represented in this yes. data? Because if we're seeing trends, we yes. want to know so and Ms. we want to be honest. Ms. Harris, just to, just to piggyback on that, just in case you didn't, you didn't uh, pick up on it when she shared that those suspensions make up 18 schools, correct? Correct. So, okay. it's out of, so out of all of our secondary schools, those make up 18 of them. So out of the 25 high schools, 40 middle schools. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. um, that's good to know. And then the other question I have, and this is clarifying again, um, this uh, second data point, seven students account for 15 suspensions for disrespect. I thought you said that sus disrespect was not, Correct. doesn't can't rise to a level five. And disrespect five. does not go past a level three. So it's, it is not an out-of-school suspension, so that means that the schools who suspended should not have suspended for disrespect. Right. Correct. So you're reading, you're reading correctly. Into okay. It. And so, and we're on to which schools those are and, okay. All right. A disrespect constitutes level three. That's an in-school suspension that mm -hmm. still takes them away from instructional time. So are we monitoring that to be sure that we're not having kids at one school being removed from class for disrespect? for an incident at another school that is not rising to that level? Yes, we, we are now monitoring that because we know that that is, like once we realize that this suspensions lived in this space and that, you know, it will come later in the conversation as to like what are we doing when we're finding these discrepancies. It is also the, the work that collaborates with the associates and directors in the Office of School Support that, you know, we need to address and work within the schools where this is occurring. So it, they are getting monitored. So my last question would be, you said this is occurring mostly in 18 schools. Can you break that down into number versus middle school and the number versus high yes. school? Yes, so there's um, nine middle schools and 11, um, it's about nine and nine, nine middle schools and nine high schools. Okay, so we should expect to hear later on some intensive something going on at those particular right. schools, okay. Yes. Can you put the slide back? Uh, back? Oh. Just let me let me Sorry. check. Arvin, did you have anything you wanted to say at this point? Okay. Not at this point, thank you. You may continue. Yes. So as you can see, um, the suspensions or the descriptions that go for disruption, it ranges. It ranges from threatening language or interactions with a staff member to instigating, engaging, engaging in conflict, erratic or dysregulated behavior, eloping, refusal to comply to hate bias incidents. So the range as to what is seen under disruption is wide. Um, please note that with the disruption code, there is sometimes a secondary code. So for example, there may be fighting and disruption that are coded in one suspension. There may be disruption in um, drugs and controlled su control substances that may be paired together in those suspensions as well. Next slide, please. Discretionary suspensions have increased in all racial subgroups. Even when discretionary suspensions decrease, it is still proportionate. This is something that Ms. Sharon shared with you earlier. For example, whether going up or down, African American and Hispanic Latino students account for 80 to 84% of all discretionary suspensions. 
and for all non-discretionary suspensions as well. Simply put, no matter the trends, whether suspensions are decreasing or increasing, we are still suspending children of color at higher rates. Next slide, please. Of 282 discretionary suspensions, meaning disruption and disrespect suspensions, for this school year, 80% are African American, Black, and Hispanic Latino students. Let uh, just back up a minute for me. Uh, yes. I, I heard you, but I want you to say it again. Now, I thought we were not suspending for disrespect, or you're making that change because what of what you saw in the data? Because you just said disrespect was in the suspension number here. So the discretionary suspensions are disrespect and disruption. Those are like the two categories that are considered the discretionary suspensions. But I thought, okay, am I missing something? I, I'm, I'm a, I hate to say I'm a little bit confused because I thought you said disrespect was level three and it didn't yes. warrant a suspension. It, it didn't. It doesn't, uh, according to the new code of conduct. The problem is, is that some schools all did it anyway. So they still suspended even though it was taken out of the code of conduct. And that is something that the office is digging into is figuring out what we need to do about that uh, with those particular schools that have done that. Because as you could see on that prior slide, there were 60 um, uh, suspensions for disrespect, which is almost double. But meanwhile, it's been taken out of the um, code of conduct. So they're, they're actually, for lack of a better word, not allowed. <laughs> so what you're telling me is that these, these charts represent uh, schools that are not complying with the code of conduct. That's what you're really saying. Correct. And so you've got a plan in place to address that issue, and we'll hear about that. Correct. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Now I'm a little clear. Okay. Are you clear? <laughs> All right, thank you. And that gets to, just, just to hammer this home, this gets to that fragmentation piece that we heard in the audit. It's that, you know, we knew taking that out of the code of conduct was the right thing to do as far as making it level five for the things that you just mentioned around, you know, what, is dis what does respect even mean? That that should not be a level five, but then the implementation of that we see not being consistent. The very fact that you have uh, these violations in these schools, to me, represents a problem with the perceptions and attitudes they have of black and Hispanic children. So I hope you're going to tell me something that I want to hear about that too, Correct. because that's a big problem. And it's a common thread, right? We go back to our anti-racist audit and the learning and the training that needs to happen along with that. And you'll hear that as we go through it as well. I, I am hoping to hear something. I, I know you want me to get off of this and move on. No, I don't. <laughs> it seems to me that a lot of the stuff I'm seeing in here that we're going to do is stuff we were doing this year, and the data was going up. The numbers are going up, not going down. And at one point, we had had numbers going down several years ago. So I don't know what's going on, but I hope you're going to tell me something because to me, it's an accountability issue in terms of the money we're putting into this kind of thing, and the number is still going up. So what are we training on? I, I need to be invited to the training because something, could somebody send me an invitation to the tr one of the training sessions? Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. And I would just, I mean, to me, I mean, and I know you guys are digging down, which I really appreciate, and looking into what's happening with school culture and climate in these schools. Because I think, you know, the research is really clear that there's an extremely protective effect when a student has even one person in a school that they feel like they can trust and that they feel like has their back. So if we, you know, the first thing that we, to me, it seems like a school should ask when something like this happens is, why doesn't the student have somebody in this school that they feel like they can trust and that they feel like has their back? It's all about, you know, what happened to these students, not what's, what's wrong with them. It's like what happened to them and what we're doing to make them feel safe, welcome, and valued in our schools. So anyway, thank you. Can you put the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, out of 1,400 total suspensions where we are right, we are right now, that's the number, 
80.6% are African American Black and Hispanic Latino students. Disproportionate suspensions of Black and Brown students is a concern whether or not the suspension is discretionary. So it does not matter which category, whether they are discretionary, we're still suspending at the same high rate the same two groups of students. Next slide, please. Um, just like Ms. Sharon shared earlier, that you know we do have a lot of work still left to do, but there has been some progress made within the past few years. This is um, data that was shared by MSDE on, or on the county suspension from 2017 up to where we are now, the 22-23 the year. You have I, I was just, I, I wanted you to kind of walk me through this, this particular chart. Okay. That, that, those numbers are the total suspensions that were reported to the state from 2017 to 2018, you have 3,697. 2018, 2019 is 3,862. 2019, 20, remember that's the year that we went out on the spring, 2,669. And then we, there was no suspensions reported during the year that we were in COVID. That's what we call it, the COVID year. Um, and then from last year, 21, 22, 2,392, and our current number is 1,411. Okay. I have a, a question about... <laughs> it scared me. <laughs> go uh, ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, go ahead, Arvin. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I, I see on this slide, slide number 11, that no suspensions were reported in uh, the 2020-2021 school year. But I think it might have been two slides before it indicated uh, some discretionary suspensions in that that same school year. So I just wanted to to see where the why why the the misalignment. There were out of school suspensions. That's probably uh, oh. why. Yes. Thank you. If we can. Wait wait wait. Yeah. We, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Just clarifying question. I think. Could you explain a little bit more the concept of discretionary suspension? So discretionary suspensions, there are two categories for that. There is disrespect and there is disruption. Those are the two areas that are, as we know, very subjective, right? So we have it in our matrix, in a student code of conduct, what is under disrespect and what is under disruption? Like what is the, you know, the classifying definition of that? When it comes to like fighting, um, alcohol, and the others, they are non-discretionary. So I think that's where the line is a little bit more clear for that. So discretionary is something that you could suspend. It doesn't necessarily have to rise to a suspension. Who makes that decision in the school building? So most of the time, it will be the principal with the assistant principal and whoever is working with that situation. It may be, you know, security brings the, the evidence of what they have gathered, the facts, the student statements um, to the administrator, and then the principal and the assistant principal look at the student, look at what the infraction is. They should be, and I say should be because we know that they're not always looking at the student code of conduct and the level of response that it should have based on the description of the incident. But at the end of the day, it's the principal's call. Yes, I was just trying to figure out what kind of data you were gathering about that also. Um, Arvin, I know that you have to depart. Do you have anything that you want to get in before you go? Yes, and unfortunately, I do have to log off in just a minute here. But uh, so thank you all for the presentation today. I did get a chance to, to kind of peek ahead, couldn't help myself and, and see some of the, uh, the strategies uh, uh, being implemented. And and I just want to add, and, and maybe this is a little too on brand for me, um, but as we continue to be reflective uh, of effective ways to mitigate both uh, suspension um, and, and certainly chronic absenteeism as well, at the core of that work, at the forefront of it, should be uh, the student voice. Uh, the bottom line is the best way to understand what students need to, to avoid uh, these issues is to ask them and so to, to see why they're not uh, going to class or, or why these incidents occur. Um, un understanding the student's perspective in all this should certainly be um, at the forefront of the work. 
Uh, so that's certainly what I wanted to add today. I'll be, be sure to do my homework and, and uh, watch through uh, the, the rest of the presentation later. So I look forward to hearing um, some additional updates and information around that. So thank you all again. Thanks, Arvin. See you later. And he makes the point that both Lynn and myself had already tried to make about relations mm -hmm. in the building. And it, to me, it's um, not only cultural, but how they feel that they could interact with the teacher. Because I know the principal or the assistant principal or somebody at that level is making the decision. But you know they feel that they have to back up the teacher. So somewhere you either have to figure out that the teacher... I don't want to say the term is the problem because that's that's not what I want to label it. But the teacher might need some more training to address the issue or either the principal does. Next slide, please. So now we're going to get to like that was the this is what it is and now the what, right? Here's where we, where we are going. So as we look to advance our work, we continue to look into the research-based strategies provided by the U.S. Department of Education. So here's a list of them um, that they have shared. Many of these practices are being implemented in our system and are aligned to the work of the Comprehensive Coordinator Early Intervening Services Plan, which is where we address a lot of our disproportionate suspensions and disciplinary in alignment with special education. So this is a collaboration place. And you'll hear a little bit more about it in a few. Um, with, within this plan, identify school leaders engaged in targeted professional development to analyze practices for addressing disproportionate suspension rates of black and brown students. Next slide. So what are we intentionally doing about this? So we, ha we know that we have established a suspension work group that meets monthly, and this is that lives within that plan that we collaborate with special education. And the, the work group's priority is to work with the identified schools addressed in the Comprehensive Coordinator Early Intervening Services Grant, which accounts for 70% of the school system's suspension. So within this grant, there are 15 identified schools, middle school and high schools, and within those 15 schools, 70% of the suspensions live there. So we know that the schools that we have targeted for this work are the schools that need to be targeted for the work. Um, we know that there needs to be an increased professional development efforts with our administrators and mental health staff, you know, applying, tracking, and evaluating the multi-tier system of supports. There has been the change to the policy, which is now moving that policy to the application process, right? Um, because the policy provides a philosophy of the behavior intervention and what the response should be like. But now it's okay, we have it on paper, now let's move it into the work within each building. Um, we are expanding our restorative approaches with staffing support and provide equity and anti-racism learning for the leaders, just like Ms. Sharon shared previously. Next slide. Can I ask a question? Yes. Mm -hmm. This suspension work group, mm -hmm. who's in that? I mean, what organizations or staff? So it is a staff from the special education office. It is a staff from um, my office, the Student Engagement Behavioral Health and Academics. And then it is, um, now we're, we are expanding it to the schools, right? Because we're starting this work with the schools to address the disproportionality. So they are going to be part of the work that we are doing with them. And then we have also the equity. We have a, represent, a representative from the equity unit that comes to our meetings to discuss what we need to roll out to schools to address disproportionality when it comes to that professional development. I wonder, and this came up when we were talking about the MOU for um, SROs mm -hmm. originally, they were talking about having school-based groupings to discuss issues. I, I'm wondering if the suspension work group shouldn't be in the school building. That, I mean, in other words, I would be more vested in what's going on if it's a group of my people and we're sitting there deciding what is going on in the building, including some students, as Arvin said, because a lot of this is cultural. I hate to, to say that I'm thinking a lot of it is cultural and a lot of it is perception, and I think somewhere there's a disconnect in how they're seeing the students, but having the work group here in central office 
just it, it doesn't have the same feeling to me as having. And I know you can't have, what, 18 of them? Maybe you can, maybe you can't. But maybe there needs to be some sort of consideration of the school itself reflecting around what's going on. And so within that, that the work of this grant, right? So we, we, we give them the data, here's the data, here's what it is. But then within the school teams, they do have a team that involves the special educator resource teacher. If they have a discrete program, then also that resource teacher for that discrete program that lives within special education. Because we also acknowledge that a lot of the disproportionality happens within special education students as well. Um, you know, the assistant principals, the principal, the staff development teacher, which is, which is another person that moves some of this professional development and rolls it out to the whole staff because they're part of this grant that addresses professional development to the whole school. Um, and then there may be opportunity to have that student voice within that group as well and the SR, I mean the CEO, you know, lends into some of what is happening when it comes to digging into the root cause analysis, because we can make all the assumptions that we want, but as you know, the live reality is within the school buildings. Yeah, I, I really think that that's important because the fact of the matter is we're not, our, our school-based st school staff at that level often is not representative of the students in that building. So if you don't bring some of those students into the discussion, you're, you're really not discussing anything that's going to be meaningful. Right. And I, I would echo that. Um, I think um, Ms. Wolf and Mr. Kim are both right. The only people that can really tell you why these incidents are happening in schools is the students themselves. And to me, the students that have been suspended under this policy, especially these um, discretionaries, they are the ones that should be in this work group. Um, they are the only ones that can tell us why they didn't feel supported, safe, welcomed in that space, why they don't have a, a trust, somebody that they feel that they can trust in that building. That, um, because it, you know, again, as Ms. Wolf said, you can have a lot of people talking and making assumptions, as you mentioned, yep. but why do that? Why not just ask them? Right. Yeah. Thank you. So over the... Over the years, the overall decline in suspensions can be attributed to some of the work that school-based leaders are doing, community partners, policymakers, and supporting offices. This year's focus initiatives to further this work include, you know, the well-being social workers that are in all the high schools. They are there to also support students that have those multiple suspensions. Um, the Bridge to Wellness Services, which is also an added layer to this year's um, initiatives. The addition of restorative coaches in all elementary schools as well, they already existed in secondary. The expansion of the number of restorative justice specialists who are placed two days a week at a disproportionate middle school. And also we have mindfulness educators who are assisting with this work. Well, this initiative is focused on professional learning and well-being, the work or academic offices in ensuring student engagement through high quality. First instruction also plays a role as well as our security, um, safety and security colleagues that are part of that. Um, next slide, please. So what is working? So we do know that the micro work works. School sites with a specialist, with a restorative justice specialist, that works in the building consistently have a bigger impact on this decreasing suspension. So we have seen that in the previous slide. We, know we, we noted that out of the eight sites that have restorative justice, especially six of them have decreased suspensions within that. Um, we know that building more proactive and consistent restorative environments is also working. It is giving them that space, that welcoming space where they feel that they do have a trusted adult. Um, we know that they are evaluate, evaluating the alignment of that philosophy, the policy, and the practice, the implementation. It is something that is working as we are working with the associate su superintendents and the directors in the Office of School Support and Wellbeing to assure, to assure alignment between suspensions and the student code of conduct. Just going to jump in real here. I was wondering if, if uh, Mr. Monteleone, if you could come down um, and share a little bit more about the work that you've done 
with the supervisors in particular, because I do want to say that uh, Mr. Monteleone and and his office, when all of those 60 what, d discretionary suspensions that shouldn't have been suspensions, when they were digging into the data, they actually did some targeted work that I know you were asking about in some of the previous slides. So I did want to give Mr. Mr. Monteleone an opportunity to share that. Hello, good to see everybody again. Um, so I, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Sharon. I think one of the challenges really that's inherent in, in this is that while we monitor this data and that we, we use our sort of justice uh, unit to really try to scale this work up across districts, and I know Mr. Ramby and I were here recently speaking to how that work is being implemented at scale, ultimately there is variability. Right about the mindset, the philosophy in each school regarding restorative justice, the approach to these types of infractions. Um, and so one of our challenges, in addition to moving that stuff, that, that work out at scale, is also that because we do not supervise principals directly, what's been great about our work this year is, the, is really the combination, right, of the work between what used to be SFSE, Student Family Support and Engagement over here, and SSI, right, School Support and, and um, Improvement. Improvement. I'm missing the <laughs> acronym already, how fast they leave our brain, right? Those two worlds used to be be relatively isolated. And under the model that we had this year, what's been really beneficial is that, um, you know, and I'll get to where we're headed on this, I, I, I partner directly with the other three associates, uh, Dr. Moran, Dr. Floyd Cooper, right, and, and Ms. Morris on these issues. And we meet bi-weekly with all of our directors. So the school supervisory directors, the nine of them, the other three associates, myself, and all of the well-being student services directors. And that does also include Jeff Sullivan, Shella Cherry, right, outside of our well-being services. What this has provided us, provide us the opportunity to do is to take the work that we're doing in well-being student services and align it to the leadership visits and the supervisory structures and processes that we have through our directors. So the example that I will give you as we come down to this point is through this process. Um, as we were developing, looking at all this data over the course of first semester and looking at our mid-year data, um, Mr. Ambi, who's president of these meetings bi-weekly, this may have been a several weeks ago, um, came and led a presentation with all the directors and the supervisors in that space, went through this data, dug down into each of the individual schools, identified those schools, right, and those uh, infractions by the directors, met with the directors, we had a conversation about it, we provided best practices, Mr. Neff was there, and then those individual directors can zero in on, right, those specific schools where they were having those challenges. And I can tell you just anecdotally that I know for a fact that multiple directors, because I was sitting at the table with them, were sending emails in real time to set up conversations about this data point. So I think part of, not our challenge, but what we need to continue to do and, and tighten is that relationship um, here at central office between our office and the school supervisory offices, which is really the same office at this point. Um, so that is how we are routinely, right? And I think we need to go from not just at the end of the semester, but at the end of the quarter. Maybe it needs to be at the interim, right? We have, to, we have to have these standing structures and processes where that data is being shared and there's action that's being taken by the directors and the, super, and the associates who supervise those schools. So this is just a clear example of how we have looked at this, triangulated it, identified the individual schools, and leaned into those school supervisory folks to be able to have those follow-up conversations with the principals and their teams. Did you have anything to say? Uh, no, thank you for that explanation. And I, I do uh, very much know exactly what we are talking about, the old days where OSSI was here, OSFSE was here, and they were, they were operating in their different silos and not as interse not intersecting in the way that I think leads to the kind of comprehensive supports that are required and sort of the, the sort of relational work together. It's not, what do we say it all the time, it's not your job, it's not my job, it's our job, and, but you have to live that. So I do appreciate that um, explanation. Um, yeah, thank you. So when do you have these follow-up conversations about accountability? So we have bi-weekly meetings as, a, as a, all the SSWB directors, right? We meet bi-weekly about a variety of 
topics. It could be school improvement data. It could be literacy data. It could be math data. It could be student well-being team visits. What data that we're jointly monitoring is part of our, our Plan Do Study Act processes that are linked together. These are bi-weekly. So I wouldn't sit here and tell you, Ms. Wolf, that we're looking at attend that we're looking at suspension data bi-weekly, but we have a, a process, a space, a structure, a common agenda where we are free to bring these items to that space. And this is all, again, new in 22-23. So um, clearly there's continued work to do, but we feel like we got the, the alignment, right, to, to be able to do the work finally. Well, my question would be, um, when could you come back to us with some data that we hope would be improved data? When should we reschedule you to come back to talk about this issue? Because discipline is at the heart of why a lot of our kids aren't in school receiving the instruction that they need to receive. So when should we expect to see some data from this year with these changes? I think we are monitoring it at this point ongoing. I know that, that Ms. Lopez Adias and Mr. Amby monitors it so routinely. I think, speaking out of term, but in my mind, as you ask that question on the fly, it seems as though we would want to go back and take a look at a before and after of where we saw the anomaly of, of um, disposition, right? If you're seeing a disposition that is outside the code of conduct in a subset of schools, I mean, we could do this quarterly, really. It would probably be a best data point. But I would, I would want to speak to the team and get a little bit more clarity on exactly what you would be looking for. If you're looking for changes at individual school level, you're looking for district-wide data, Ms. Wolf. I'm looking for those. How many schools did you say? 18 schools to show improvement. If they're the ones that are, that are resulting in the numbers that we're seeing, I would be looking for the data from those particular schools. Um, because, again, I think that discipline has been at the heart of some of our disproportionality for years in this, in this county, and we have to get a grip on this. Um, so we, we will discuss this and come up with a date because I don't think that we can wait until next year this time. Oh, no, I, I was going to say, if it could be, I mean, whenever this committee meets or whatever would be an appropriate use of time. But I think to look at any type of change, I would offer just at this table, potentially at the quarterly mark. Well, that's why I was asking you, because if I understood Ms. Arias, right, uh, correctly, a lot of this was just implemented in February, right? Yes. A lot of it is, has just picked up now with it. Okay. So you would need a little bit of time for it to take effect. So I'm just trying to figure out when would be a good time if I'm going to reschedule this issue to reschedule it. We have a um, meeting in May. We do have a meeting in May. And so it might be a, a, a appropriate okay. time to circle back to this conversation. And perhaps, um, and we could obviously discuss this further, um, but you know, something that I think Ms. Lopez Arias, you know, noted that I think is profound is that 70% of our suspensions are coming from 15 schools. So perhaps we spend some time really digging into what's being done in those particular places and some, you know, maybe, maybe there's been some changes in those particular areas that we could really focus on. So it's a little bit more of a deep dive instead of a, a broad, mm -hmm. a broader overhang. Absolutely. We'll, we will continue this conversation, and Elsie and, um, will be in touch with you about a date for this. So go ahead. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, wait a minute. Ms. Harris has a quick question. I just have a quick question. I'm not sure if this would go to Ms. Lopez Arias or Mr. Monteleone. As you're doing this work, are, um, one of the things that I'm also – so we're looking at, you know, 18 schools and, and, and then the 70 percent of all these suspensions out of 15 schools. Are you identifying um, – I'm not even sure what the right term here would be, but sort of risk factors in the way the school is operating, the attitudes in administration that might predict we might see this same trend in other schools if we aren't watching, if we aren't mindful. Um, because there's a reason we're seeing this disproportionality in these schools. And are we seeing any, any indicators that tell us why, that we can apply system-wide to prevent seeing these same things in other schools? Just a question. 
I would wonder if, if our training is effective if the schools did not know that the code of conduct had removed <clears throat> these items from suspension to level three. I mean, I don't know that it is or isn't, but you might want to take a look at the training that you're actually providing to people to see if that is being recognized. Yes, and that is on what are we going to do next. Oh, okay. It is going to be <laughs> looking at the training and looking at specific scenarios and walking them through the response and that code of conduct level of response that matches that. We'd also like to know when that training occurs because we, we might will. be interested in sitting in on that too. Absolutely. Thank you. And I mean, I would be interested in such things as when we're looking at these 18 schools, really 15 schools, are we seeing, for instance, uh, it's, uh, these schools are more likely to have a new principal or a significant proportion of their administrative team new or not, or people who've been there for a long time. And, you know, those kinds of things I think could help us just know, you know, when these kind of uh, circumstances arise in a school, we need to be doubly watchful or making sure that these interventions are proactive instead of reactive. Can I, can I just ask a clarifying question? So um, I know we're capturing, if this isn't my committee or mine, and I'm sure that, that the chair. We are all Aaron, part of is, the yeah, strategic yeah, right. planning. We're all, we're all part of it, yes. Everybody is a part of this. I, I'm just saying, I know that Ms. Sharon's team is capturing all, all these, these action items. Thank you. Um, but I, I think what I, so one, I've heard, let's come back specifically and do a deeper dive in May. And then I guess what you're asking for, Ms. Harris, is outside of like a mindset of the principal or the team, are there is there any anything statistically that we could conclude right by looking at these eighteen schools right? So is it a veteran principal? Is it a new principal? Are they up county? Are they down county? What's their demographics? What are the, the size of the school? What have you? So is there anything that would maybe indicative right of this outside of just a philosophy of an individual right? That's what you're looking for. Yeah, I think okay. so. And I'm looking at Ms. Addison, Dr. Addison back there. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Because I know this is her, what she loves to do is drill down into these kind of data points and see, do that kind of statistical analysis. I, you know, sometimes having done some of this work in the past, you, you are surprised in what you see, what you. Well, and I think, you know, it, it's also, there's always a story here, right? So it's not even just about the, the, the demographic and the, and the data about the school or the staff, but who are these kids getting suspended, right? Are we seeing the, like, you know, the same kids getting suspended what, is, is is repeat offenders because there's a story within a story and I think that would be really powerful to bring back is are there commonalities with this story within a story about the student experience what does that look like absolutely and I think that uh, Miss Harris raises a good point the point being just what you were saying are we really collecting the data we need to find out what that story is what the data points are Okay. Absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah, you're good. Okay. All right. So we do know that some schools are having success within those 15 schools. Um, so I will highlight a little bit of what they have done to get some of their successes they're seeing within their suspension rates. So we know that um, schools that have seen a decrease in their suspension rate are providing spaces for students to use when they need it. For example, at Briggs Cheney Middle School, they have a mindfulness room with a mindfulness teacher that offers individual and group support during their grade level lunch periods. Um, in addition, they offer a mindfulness course for seventh and eighth graders to take as an elective course for a semester. The administrative team, counselors, and restorative justice coaches collaborate with each other to respond to student behaviors and concerns from both a mindfulness and a restorative lens. This semester, they're implementing a restorative justice request form to provide support to both staff and students to open it up for access to all. At Benjamin Banneker Middle School, they offer a mindfulness room for individual and group support through self-reflection opportunities, problem solving, and for conflict resolution as well. This room is supported all day by a teacher and additionally, the Alternative One teacher and restorative justice coach provide opportunities for self-reflection, development of conflict resolution skills, and positive reinforcement with students. So there's explicit teaching of some of these skills to the students. 
The leadership team at this school is also providing time within their monthly staff meetings for professional development on restorative practices and approaches. Um, you know, and within that frame, we are also ha gathering student voice data through a restorative justice student voice professional learning community that is held monthly. So students come to that space, they are able to share some of the things that they see within their buildings, have a voice from a specialist and guidance as to, okay, this is how it is, you know, how this issue may be dealt within the school, within the group, or within, you know, your student-led groups. Okay, just, I, you've gone a little fast, yes. so I just want to be sure I'm clear. Now, is that the suspension team, kind of the school-based part of it? Or what? What, no, we what have, grouping are you referring to? So we to? have a restorative justice, a student okay. voice group that, oh, okay. that meets <clears throat> monthly in Zoom, where this is a space for student voice to come with what they see within their schools, what are some of the practices that they would like to elevate, and how can our unit assist them in doing that in their buildings. Each school has one of these? Um, no, this is a county, a, a, a secondary group that comes in Zoom. So this is a professional learning community that was held by the that is a space held by restorative justice specialists, oh. where students from all the secondary schools are invited to join. Okay. The, all of the them group, are invited. All of them. Oh, yep. That's, that's very interesting. I meant to ask you on the suspension team, is Dr. Addison on the suspension team? I think it's really important to have a data person on there. We do have um, Donna Blaney in our team and one of her specialists as well. Uh, I'm looking at, yes. yep, I'm looking yeah, at, at Mr. Lynch. Yeah, we have, we yes. Who are, who are accustomed to running that uh, data from that Okay, I just wanted to be sure somebody on there from student accountability. All right. Next slide, please. We're almost done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what else needs to be considered, right? So we need to go back to um, making sure that we focus the anti-racist work as a system and locally within the buildings. Um, you know, include administrators in the deeper level of planning, which is something that we are going to make sure that we're doing in those 15 schools that we continue to talk about through the work of that grant within special education. Um, there's the code of conduct, the training that includes real world dissection of incident and includes those alternatives to suspensions. What are some alternatives to suspensions that could be used instead of an out of school or in school suspension for certain of these incidents? Um, suspension review and dialogues within the schools, which will be part also of that grant that we're targeting those 15 schools for, that there will be a monthly checkup with their team to see how is their plan being implemented, what are the supports that they need from our offices to make sure that they continue to align their work. Um, create a, a system of checks and balances, which is something that, you know, Mr. Montalioni referred to as to how are we checking this more consistently and providing that feedback with our directors who work directly with our schools. Um, you know, professionals at all levels continue to learn about the, the adolescent emotional response and increase, which is huge because, again, we are going back to what is disrespect, what is disruption, what does that look like, and where does our lens come into play. Increase our partnerships and alignments across all of our offices because this work is, doesn't live just in one space. It is all of us that needs to include our communities. Um, next slide, please. And well, we've had a lot of discussion. <laughs> <laughs> and we're here. <laughs> I do have a question, just because um, I'm not sure. I, going back to, um, well, you don't have to go back, but hate bias incidents, where are they in this? And how are they being handled? Because they've been increasing in our schools and whatever is going on doesn't seem to be abating any. So I'm wondering, what are we doing there? Um, and I'm, I'm going to look at Mr. Montalioni. Correct me if I'm wrong. Hey, bias lists on a category. Come on bias. down. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> it just wasn't discussed in any of the things, but it is on a slide, so I wanted to get a... Yes, it was one of the descriptions used under disruption for one of, at least one of those incidents that was captured in the 282. Yes. The question is on hate bias. Where does it live? 
So hate, hate bias is actually something that, depending on how that manifests itself, right? So you could have a hate bias act, such as the graffiti, right, or the swastika, and that would be, there's a code for vandalism, right? You could potentially, in, in a terrible case, have an assault on a student because of some sort of you know, preju prejudice or some sort of bias, right, that, that somebody may have, a hate-based assault. So you could have a number of different ways that this manifests. And so the, the hate bias incident, we tend to think of them as, oh, there's a, you know, there's a, a swastika here, or somebody defaces the sign at a school, which it could be. Um, and, but it, it could be any number of things in, in reality. It's a reason that somebody commits a violation that, without it being hate bias, would, would be a standalone violation unto itself, right? Um, and so in addressing that, it's even more important, we believe, that you, that you have that conversation with the student because restorative justice is not just, a restorative practices, I should say, is not just about an alternative tradi to traditional discipline, right? And, and yes, it is also about restoring, say, a conflict between two individuals. Yes, it is that. But also through the conversations and the circles and the edification that we're trying to have students go through, it is about teaching the student that commits the, 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 whatever the incident is about how they, how they restore themselves within the community, right? And how they learn from that. So I think it's even more important as I sit here uh, as, as an associate superintendent who supports this work, that when a student commits a, a hate bias crime uh, incident, I should say, yes, we want to make sure that, that, that we are quick and we are firm in our response, but that is also a serious learning uh, opportunity for a student when they are young to really understand the gravity of what they have done, especially if they don't have a sense of history, right, as they may not if they're 13, 14, 15 years old, and that's part of the process as well. So it doesn't stand alone necessarily unto itself. It's embedded within. I understand that, and I understand what you said about restorative justice and working with a student to teach them. But how do you restore the rest of the school that might have um, feelings of being unsafe there because of what happened? How, I mean, I don't. I really don't know what you're doing around that, and wanted to hear a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it's going to be different, and I'll, I'll take that both from where I've sat to support Ms. Jaramby and her RJ team. They are out at schools daily, right? And as, as I said, I also work consistently with the other associate supervisors who supervise schools. But as somebody who sat in the seat as, as a principal and had and dealt with these incidents, um, you have, I mean, it, there's not one easy answer. And these are polarizing incidents. Let's be real here, right? Mm -hmm. So some of the same folks who might want a liberal approach, a progressive approach in some areas, maybe the same folks who are asking for firm and swift old school discipline in this area. And we know that. And I think that this is the challenge, I'll be brutally honest, this is the challenge that we are facing as public, public educators. The paradigm of the leadership responsibilities for our principals has shifted. It's not just about teaching and learning, it is about managing these highly politically sensitive uh, issues, right, in our schools. So the answer would be, you have to engage your community. You have to talk to the people who have been harmed the most, whatever the target victim group would be, and identify with them what would restore, right, in your mind, your feeling of safety or your, your comfort in knowing that this is not a school that allows this stuff to happen or condone this. And it's work. And there is no simple, easy answer. And this is where we are. We, we, we do not want to just you know, throw a kid out and, and, and lock the door and throw away the key for any reason. I knew you didn't have an easy answer for that. But I was just wondering if the Restorative Justice Student Voice Group is a, is a perfect vehicle for dealing with some of this issue, since you're saying that all of the I guess it's high school students, middle school students middle and high. can participate. It seems to me that's a perfect vehicle to try to have some of these discussions, particularly around hate bias, because it's insidious and, and it, you know, I don't know how you get a handle on just one school and then it pops up at the next school. So maybe we need bigger conversations and figure out what's going on in their minds. 
Yeah. And I think, you know, you, you bring up a really good point. <clears throat> and as you said, like, you know, I think sometimes we're, we, we're focused and I think a good example is last year, if you all remember when some of the, it was a student, it, they moved everybody at the public comments, a student from one of the, the soccer teams, I think at Einstein came and spoke mm -hmm. about how harmed she was, and she was a, a white female student, um, with some of the racial comments that were being made and, and the impact that it had on her in the community. And it wasn't just about, well, let's give X, Y, Z a punishment, but what do we do systemically to address these issues that have been constantly there? So I do want to say that, that there has been and continues to be robust conversations with students around this. Our study circles program through the Equity Initiatives Unit oftentimes goes in proactively and reactively um, to address some of this in conjunction with some of the work that's happening around um, restorative justice. And it really does need to be um, a situation where where we're giving students the opportunity to really unpack for them for themselves what happened and what it means to them and how we go about, like Damon said, kind of repairing the issue. Um, what we have also done, and there's been certain instances that have happened this year that I know that there has been some collaboration between SSWB and the Equity Initiatives Unit, where they have provided robust professional learning, not only to the staff around how they're handling certain situations, but also with the students um, around, around you know, what they need to do to engage, which also then involves involves the community. So those are some things that I know we have been actively engaged in. Um, I, w I wish it was one of those things where you can just kind of put a, this is the process, you do X, Y, and, and apply a very technical response to it. But as you know, it's very nuanced based on the community that it occurs in, what the specific incident is. Um, but what you elevate, I think, is critical that we continue to do, and I think we are doing and need to continue to do, is elevating that student voice and engaging the community um, around this. because. The reality is, is that some of these, and I ju I'm just reflecting on my own f uh, fifth grade son, who you know is 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 10 years old and comes home and, and shares with me some of the things that other third, fourth, and fifth graders are saying. Sometimes we're battling against what kids are learning outside of what we have control over. Absolutely, I was just curious because we've been talking and focused on uh, restorative justice. How does this conversation fit into the anti-racist audit? about uh, hate bias. How, how, what are we doing there? How are we bringing that, that into it? Well, Ms. Wolf, you want to preview the May 11th uh, board meeting where we're going to... No, uh, I'm, I'm glad you actually mentioned that because that is actually a huge component um, that came out loud and clear in the audit is around the hate bias work and what and actually SSWB is taking on the charge around some of this work of developing an action plan to specifically address some of that work and what we're doing right now, um, just a preview, which I think is really exciting work that's going to be coming to all of you in a few months, is we have unpacked each of the six domains of the anti-racist audit school culture is where a lot of that hate bias um, component comes into, is we have worked on unpacking those six domains and we have gone through um, a process where um, offices and staff have been dissecting the audit dissecting the root causes around what this, these issues are and engaging in the identification of some action plans in collaboration with the, all of the voice data that we've gotten, the community conversations that we have engaged in, that's going to be coming to the board because we're identifying actions to address all six of those domains in a very targeted way. Um, and we're in the midst of doing all of that right now and engaged in an accountability structure um, along with that. That's in alignment with our strategic plan. Well, I'll wait and see. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, it really is a big issue because a lot of our students are feeling uncomfortable around what's being said or what's being displayed in their school. Mm -hmm. But it also raises the issue of bullying. And mm -hmm. I noticed that, <laughs> you know, we didn't really hit on that part of it. But um, bullying is a big part of hate bias also. So, uh, Ms. Harris, did you have anything you wanted to Say at this point. Just a, a couple of things, looking mainly at slide 15. Um, so first question I have in your box that says non-negotiables, very clearly in there, says centering students in decision making when it comes to behavior intervention. 
So I am a strong believer in every problem-solving conversation in a school needs to involve first and foremost, and at the beginning, the students. Because if we see a problem, they see it too, and they see it in many, 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 many more different ways and from many, many, many more up close, um, you know, in many more ways. Um, so what does that look like in a school? If that's a non-negotiable, what does that look like? So it may look differently, right? Um, and remember that there is a restorative justice coach that lives in every building. So this is a place where, where the restorative justice, if we have a specialist, it is a place where they are being used to debrief because sometimes the student may not have that close relationship either with the security personnel that's working with the situation or the administrator that's working with that situation. So they may ask, can I speak to Mr. or Mrs. whoever it is that there's the, the restorative justice coach that has been assisting them in other conflicts or you know, with other peer relations. So it is about debriefing. Debriefing what happened, getting perspective from the student. Because again, like you said, they are the ones who are involved and they see it differently that the adult is receiving that behavior. And then having that meeting with whoever is going to make a decision as to what is the next step here? What is, is there a consequence? What does that look like? And what is the accountability that as the student is taking? What, what is it that you're owning from here? And what is going to shift when a situation like this arises again? Okay. okay. Um, Thank you, and I, I, I'm looking, you mentioned this monthly restorative justice PLC, which is open time for stu uh, middle and high school students to zoom in. And um, So how are students made aware of that? And what is the student uh, uptake like? How many students are, are popping into these monthly events? So it varies. So there is um, a flyer that is posted in every secondary building. The restorative justice um, coach receives also information reminders um, there is a, a QR code that the students are able to take a picture with their phone and then they log in and then our restorative justice specialists send them a Zoom link to do that. So it may vary from maybe 100 to 150 students who come at a time. They don't always stay for the entire amount of the, the hour. They come and go. So is there something central like that's getting to students through their canvas or their synergy so yes. they're seeing that centrally as Correct. well, not just a fire on a wall? Yes, and we also have a student restorative justice um, canvas classroom page that is populated in their canvas classroom as well. And are we, um, are we sort of monitoring, um, are we seeing a lot of students, are we, where are these students coming from? Are we seeing a lot of students from a few schools or are we seeing sort of a broad, you know, um, students broadly coming from all schools or so that we and, can? And that is an excellent question. I know I, I personally have not dived into the data, but I will be interested to see what the makeup of the students are and whether it's predominantly one area than the other. And are these monthly PLC sessions and I hope I know the I, I hope the answer is this. Are they uh, more asking and less telling? So we're really yes. we're, it's really dialogue. So they come in with their voice to okay. share. Okay, good. And elevate things yeah. that they would like to implement. Yes. I bet we're getting good information, good <laughs> ideas. Um, I'm sure. Yeah, I'd love to hear sort of a synopsis of some of the ideas, the student generated organic Absolutely. ideas that are bubbling up from that group. Um, and a question, this is a clarifying question. I think a couple of times when you've been talking about the 15 schools, 15 schools, 70% of these incidents, there's a grant that's supporting the work? Yes, and I believe um, this was information shared in the fall through the Special Education Office. So there is a grant um, that addresses disproportionality in suspensions, not just with special education students, but also with the whole student body as well. But in looking at the data, those are the 15 schools that were identified based on the criteria of their suspension. And I believe that the grant, wasn't that shared in the Special Pops yes. um, committee meeting earlier this year in the fall? Yeah, I believe they, were, they shared about that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is it multi-year? Is this the grant? Okay. okay. It existed when I was a principal, so it's been around. It's been two years. Mm -hmm. It runs for each, each time it runs for two years. Who's the grant e grantor? Sorry. Actually, come on, come on, down. Time to join. <laughs> Are these the students being affected disproportionately, though? Yes. Okay. That's what that's That's how they were identified. So this is the comprehensive coordinated early intervention grant that we did share. About. I, I, 
I have a question that when he finishes. So we use, That's we trying use to run term, away. We use the term grant. We use the term grant, but it's actually mandatory for any school system that is found to be significantly disproportionate in three major ca categories, identification of students discipline for, for disabilities, and it looks at all the different demographic yeah. um, groups. Um, disciplinary removals, there's three different categories for that. So that's in school, out of school, 45 day, and then also for placements. Okay. And so that's specific to looking at students with disabilities, but if, a st but if a school system is found to be significantly disproportionate in any one of those areas, it triggers the shifting of funding. So it's, they call it a grant, but it's really a shifting of funding from our IDA funds over to the use of prevention and support for addressing the disproportionality. So it's really shifting of, of monies to address those, those needs specifically. And so it can, it can support um, the work of students who are currently not identified with disabilities, but also identify with disabilities. And so these, um, the 15 schools that we have decided to target in this cohort or this cycle, there's a lot of overlapping data where we see that a, they are disproportionately suspending African American students uh, with disabilities, but B, they also have this larger data that that um, we're hearing, you know, shared today um, by Ms. Um, Arias Flores. So, <clears throat> so there's a lot of overlap, and so it is a two year. Each grant is a two year cycle, um, and so we would we would look to reexamine the data. This work was started prior to the pandemic. Um, and there was uh, there are a group of schools that have showed some wonderful progress. One of them was mentioned today, and so they will be lifted up in this process as well to, to talk about what they've uh, done well and how they've um, helped to reduce their their numbers as as we work through that um, with the with all of those schools. So we have the 15 schools coming together, and then after that, we will work individually with each of the 15 schools with a group of folks that will be um, monitoring their individual plans moving forward yeah okay thank you, thank you. Um, and last question I have and this is I, I guess I, I guess I don't know what kind of um, work we're doing in this area so just asking so when we see an incident we talked about hate bias which can encompass all kinds of acts as, as Mr. Monteleone mentioned but say for instance when we address the incident which could look like insubordination or disrespect so, and if we, you know, it's a, a student in a classroom being respectful to their non cisgender teacher, for example, and you start doing, you know, a little bit of investigation and what you're learning is, or, or a student is making anti-Semitic comments or whatever, and you're finding that, as you mentioned, some of this, uh, this behavior is occurring in a school, but it it's, has its genesis outside of school. And you're finding, for instance, the students um, in their in their home life, in their family life, is just ingrained in a value system that's immersed in homophobia or anti-Semitism. What are we doing at that point when you're seeing that what the behavior of the student is behavior that they're basically being taught in their family and that's being reinforced in their family in a positive way? Oh, what do we just, do? I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. I thought you were finished. Go ahead, finish. No, that's... I, I was just going to jump in there and say, I, I think she... Starts in on a question that I have. Is there a consistent process for handling hate bias, or is this something that we're allowing each school to handle differently? Even though we know the incident may be different, is there a process requirement by the system for handling these? Yes, there most definitely is. And Greg Edmonds' office is one of the first places that hate bias incidents goes. There's a report done. There's a communication whole flow chart that, that needs to be followed when there is a hate bias incident. That includes communication with the community because one of the issues that that I've been receiving emails about is the time it took to get a communication out to the community. So I, I mean, I'm assuming there's a process that's written somewhere. Yes. Okay. Could you send that to me? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. And 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 again, I just gets to you know, if the behavior that is being manifested in a school that's unacceptable. But it's the product of a value system that the student all utter, is otherwise immersed in, and that is reinforced for them. What do we do at that point? 
So that's a that's a tough question. But at the end of the day, what MCPS has said very loud and clear is that every single student in the system has the right to be safe, seen, valued, and heard. And if someone is going to violate somebody else's um, ability to be safe, seen, valued, and heard, then there are consequences for that. Um, but we can do, all we can do, I mean, we can't necessarily control what happens or what, what someone wants to talk about in their own family or the values that they do, but we do know what our values are as a system and what the expectations are for how our children interact. And we can engage in not just consequences, but education for kids so that they understand what the expectations are at school. And this, maybe this goes to Mr. Neff with the pupil personnel workers, but is there engagement with families when you're, when you're doing your root cause analysis and the root cause is family? Yes. And while we, as Ms. Sharon said, while we can't always change the hearts and minds of what happens in the home, ultimately we have a code of conduct and we have a system of expectations of what happens in our schools and our school communities. Yeah. And so what may or may not be acceptable under your roof, within your walls, it's not acceptable, and there are consequences if, if there are violations. So since hate, bi hate bias is in the suspensions, we should expect to see that incorporated into the data that you're submitting also, right? I mean, it's, it's hard to tell to me, just looking at this chart, level one, level two, level three, level four, if you're collecting data by type of incident, or, or just how you're collecting data on that. We do collect data on serious incidents and we do collect them by, if it's a hate bias incident, we can uh, pr provide the numbers on that. Okay, but I mean, where are consequences in here? I'm trying to figure that part out. So hate bias is not, it, it is not one of the categories or offenses for the disposition. So they live under what was the result of that incident, right? So was it a disruption to the community? Was it something else that uh, elevated separate. to, it's not a separate mm -hmm. entity that will be a category for a suspension code disposition? So Okay, so it's just kind of floating down there well, at the bottom. Yes, the but we do collect the data, like Ms. Sharon said, in our serious incident database that is different from this. So that's where that lives, and we can share those numbers and information with you if you would like. Okay, so she mentioned consequences. That's what I'm trying to figure out. The consequences are being applied evenly across the board because I wanted to be sure that whatever we're doing is we have a, a process for it and that we're not just allowing the school to decide what they're going to do about it, if anything, you know? Absolutely, yes. It includes communication with yes. the, the community. Okay, okay, thank you. You can. All right, we're up to the next slide. Finally. Sorry, I'm just going to mention one more thing. One more thing it just triggered in my brain that I wanted to mention is that some, some hate bias incidences, too, we have to remember, they elevate so high that they automatically become a hate crime and we have mandatory reporting with the police. Right. I so that surpasses the whole suspension, right? Like we're going right to the police so that there's, there's that right. differentiation as well. Right. I, was, I knew that, but I wasn't, I wasn't talking about those kind of incidents. Thank you. That's all it was. I, I'm just I, looking at don't, the but, but listen, don't go far. Don't go. Don't go far. <laughs> So good afternoon, and, and thank you for the opportunity to start this dialogue. As you mentioned, Ms. Wolf, um, both of these topics are a proxy for student well-being. They're also a top uh, proxy for student engagement and student connectedness to their schools. I want to talk to you to tell you what you're seeing in these data. Um, the blue bar is the last full school year before the pandemic hit. So it is the 2018-2019 school year. And then we skip a couple of years. And then the orange or red is the last school year. So that was our first full school year. And then the gray is the data for this school year for the first quarter. And it's chronic absenteeism data. So what is the data telling us? Um, clearly, the same groups that Ms. Lopez Arias um, that popped in her data, um, they're disproportionately represented here. Um, what we also notice is that we have not bounced back 
to the extent we would have liked to pre-pandemic levels in terms of our attendance data. And so we have to, you know, decide are we going to become overly discouraged by that or are we going to, is that going to make us more resolute? And so the, the data nationally is pretty daunting as far as the lack of bounce back, but, but we're excited about the opportunity to partner some of our strategies with the work of the uh, anti-racist system audit, because we do think there's a strong, strong, you know, culture and climate component to why students come to school and why parents choose to, to send their children to school. The next slide, just very briefly, just shows that our service groups are similarly um, disproportionate in their representation in our chronic absenteeism data. And just, just a quick um, definition, chronically absent is absent 10% or more of the school days in which you were enrolled, and it doesn't matter if they are excused or unexcused. So 10% of the days, so if you're here a full, full school year and you hit 18 school days absent for whatever reason, illness, travel, um, you are chronically absent. Next slide, please. So there are so many different root causes for chronic absenteeism and why students don't come to school. These are some of the ones that have been highlighted. And this is not scientific data. It's more anecdotal um, from student voice, um, feedback from school-based staff. And, and they're, they're ever-changing. For example, you know, several of us spent a lot of time this weekend working to identify all of the students that were and families that were impacted by that big fire in Silver Spring. Um, you know, trying to track them down. Where are they? What do they need? Is transportation a need? Because again, clearly something that traumatic is something that's going to impact um, attendance. But, but I'll draw your attention to the bottom right um, reason, because it always, you know, so many things these days really circle back to the anti-racist system audit. You know, if our black and Hispanic families don't feel welcome, um, don't feel valued, don't feel seen and heard, it really is not a surprise that they are not sending their students to school at the same rate as, as some of their other peers. And so Attendance Works, which is a national um, group that we work with, they note that the single most effective way to combat chronic absenteeism is to create a positive learning environment in each of our schools. So it's really about the environment we're asking them to come to. Uh, Mr. Monteleone and I often have conversations and he talks about the push and pull. Um, what is it that we're offering to students that pushes them to come into our schools, and then what are the barriers and the distractions that are pulling them out of our schools? Can I ask you a question? Sure. Particularly about that bottom bullet. Mm. There was an article in the paper, you know, right around the end of COVID, not the end of COVID, but before the kids came back to school, that suggested that many black males went to a virtual platform because they felt that they were not being, um, they, they felt that they were not being seen and heard in the building. Mm -hmm. And they were doing actually a lot better. I'm wondering, did you, can you break this data out, virtual academy versus those who are in the building? We certainly can, absolutely. I, I want to see the absenteeism rate by race, if you can do that, of those yeah. who are in the virtual. No, we academy. can definitely do that because you're right. Um, there, there are some students for whom it was a benefit, and that's. Mm -hmm. And and I'm going to sort of articulate a little bit of that in, in future slides about what what continue to be some of the options for some of our students for how they access their their academics. Um, you can go to the next slide. So I mentioned attendance works. We we've always accessed sort of their resources and their information um, because they're such a great resource. But we've really started to you know engage with them more. Um, several of us um, are have participated in a series of webinars around chronic absenteeism. Amy Beal, who is our coordinator of our uh, community schools 
is in the process of arranging for some dis, uh, some for some direct consultation with us from the staff at Attendance Works. And these are just four sort of buckets of root causes that they look at in terms of you know different you know ways to look at why students may not be coming to school because each of those different reasons is likely to have a different approach. So it just gives us an opportunity to not give a blanket reason why this family or this group of students isn't coming to school, but really ask ourselves the why behind that. You can go to the next slide. So this, I want to spend a little bit of time just talking about you know, where we've been, where we are, and, and where we're going and hope to go. And so we've always been you know, very good at attendance, outreach, and contacts. You know, whether it's letters or phone calls or text, when students hit a certain threshold in our schools, you know, we're reaching out. And it's you know, the expectation is it starts at the classroom level and you know might be the attendance secretary, counselor, um, pupil personnel worker, administrator. Um, we also have a sort of a sequence of problem solving meetings that might start at the school level. There's an attendance matters, which is an internally run by the division of pupil personnel and attendance services. Um, that is more countywide where families can be referred to a team of PPWs for additional supports. And we have our truancy interventions, which are used in very, very limited um, situations because we really we, we don't want to be about come to school or else you know or this punishment could happen we really want to find out um, you know what are the barriers what's not drawing you into our schools and what we can do about that you can go to the next slide so the evolution of the student well-being teams and the work within the the pandemic taught us that there is great benefit to look at student data more in the aggregate as well. And so, you know, we have opportunities through various reports and synergy to be able to pull, for example, all of the students who are absent at X elementary school, who have 10% or more absences at X elementary school. And then within that um, database or that spreadsheet, it will give you a month by month breakdown. So we re it really gives us an opportunity to look at trends and to target students and families who need to be addressed. Because I mentioned, you know, 10% is not a lot. If you for whatever reason missed the first five days of school, you would it would be until the 51st day of school that you came off that chronic absenteeism list. But if you've been in there every day since, there's other than monitoring, there's really no need for structured attendance intervention. So the reports that we get in Synergy allow us to look at trends and so allow us to see which students show, show, showed up on our list this month that we haven't seen before and why. And Sometimes it might just be, you know, he had COVID and he was out for five days. Um, other, you know, he's been, you know, he's been back for two weeks and he hasn't missed a day since. But it just allows us to look at the data like each student is a story in order to do that. Um, so, and then we do we do continue to access our student well-being teams for those chronic cases because they have all of the the experts at the table around mental health issues and community resource issues and issues in the school. So that you know, in the many meetings that I sit in, inevitably, you know, one or two staff members know incredible detail about the students home and family situation, and then there's just the opportunity to brainstorm, you know, what is it we can do to try to, to further encourage their um, increased attendance. You can go to the next slide. So in terms of where we're going, um, again, it's culture and climate work that we will continue to attach ourselves to because very frankly if if we can include uh, improve the culture and climate of every school building that those numbers will increase just in and of themselves um, but we're not use you know we're not abdicating responsibility in our office in terms of what can we do responsively when there are students um, that are not attending school, even even despite perhaps our our improved culture and climate in our school buildings, um, our high school principals and our high school staff are really concerned about 
attendance. And we very reasonably and appropriately sort of did an all bets are off kind of thing during the pandemic where, you know, we just we want to be supportive and encouraging and we want you to log in and we want we don't want to add, you know, punitive measures and things like that. And what we lost within that, very frankly, is a level of, of student accountability. Um, it seems like right now all of the accountability is really on the teachers to keep doing and doing and doing. And so I in working with a group of high school principals and a bunch of, you know, some assistant principals and some central office administrators, we want to bring back a, a, an accountability measure. We, we know we want it to be equitable and we know we don't want it to be punitive. And those of you who've been, you know, around in the system and paying attention to the system, we found E3 was our latest iteration pre-pandemic, the E3 process, and then loss of credit before, you know, years before that. And it just showed that black and brown students were um, disproportionately impacted by that. So we know that whatever, and we also saw, um, and we've, we were talking about this in the, in the discipline conversation, we, we saw inequitable or very varied application of it in our 25 high schools. Mm -hmm. So we know anything that we do, we're going to want to make sure that it is solid in terms of its equity and that it is solid in terms of its implementability so that we can get the buy-in of each of the 25 principals and their administrative teams and their teaching staff to implement the attendance intervention process. Also, you know, Ms. Wolf, you mentioned the virtual part of it. I think we just have to acknowledge that there are students, maybe it's uh, issues related to home, maybe it's babysitting younger children, maybe needing to work, you know, maybe other family needs, that they, they want to access their education um, they are capable of accessing their education. They just, for a variety of reasons, do not have the ability to get to our schools Monday through Friday from 7.30 to 2.30. And so I think we just have to continue to think about all of our options, you know, our virtual academy, online pathways, Edmentum, and we need to continue. What, what is out, what are all, our TALS program, what are all of the things that are out there, and then what more can we use to, because the reality is there are some students who are accessing their education, but they have a very high level of absence, and it's because our attendance monitoring and capturing process hasn't really caught up yet to students who are really there, they're mastering material, but n they're not sitting in our seats. And so we, we have to sort of collectively figure that out. And then um, there's also research about getting out into the community and uh, in, not into homes, but at homes and just, you know, knocking on doors, promoting um, the importance of regular attendance. Each of our schools has the ability to look at their data. And I think if there is a major shift that we want to emphasize, it's not solving uh, a case um, student by student. And I think you can go to the next slide. Not, like we will continue to need to work student by student in problem solving, but we also need to look broadly at our groups. So for example, if I'm at an elementary school, I might think of a specific neighborhood or a specific apartment complex that has traditionally had data, attendance data that was significantly low the rest of the school population. And I might think of well, what are the proactive outreach efforts we can do? What is the encouragement we can do? What is the engagement we can do? What are the incentives that we can implement to try to, to bring that? So each school, again, has sort of a data story about their community and who is and is not who are and are not coming to school. So, you know, one last time, you know, I will circle back to the anti-racist system audit and say, you know, when, when the data tells us that our students and families don't feel welcome, that they don't feel that they're communicated with the same level of explanation um, and clarity as, as other families, then when 
you know, every morning, like those of us who are parents know, like for some of us, it's a no brainer, but we know every morning it's a decision. Do, does my child or do my children go to school or not? And there are always factors, you know, they're, they're a little bit under the weather. They got to bed really late last night or whatever. For those of us who are significantly engaged with our schools, we overcome those minor barriers and we send our children anyway. For those families who are less, they may err on the side of not. And so I think it, it comes back to how, are, how effectively are we welcoming our families and making them feel engaged. And so um, I will now turn it back over for discussion. I, I'm just intrigued by this accountability accountability model that you have that you are going to develop, I guess, for students. Uh, do you, can you talk a little bit about that? Do you have a vision? Yeah, I'm a that? little intrigued about it myself, <laughs> just because. Do you have the vision for I it? have a, I have, I absolutely have a vision because 100% the first 95% of it is the responsibility of the school. So there needs to be classroom-based outreach. There needs to be, you know, what I might call tier two intervention um, in terms of collaborative problem solving amongst the team and the counselor and the PPW. There, there, I, the, the high school principals have told me that even though it wasn't the most popular thing in the past, they're, they're sort of chomping at the bit to get the attendance intervention plan back into their buildings. So it will definitely involve a structured attendance intervention plan where it's collaborative between student, parent, and teaching team. What are the things that we can do for you? What are some things that you can do at home? What are some things that you can do student to improve your attendance? And this is where we can start to throw out the different, you know, virtual options, you know, you know, credit recovery options and things like that, if there are reasons why a student may not be able to attend seven days. And so we have, a, the vision is around effective and consistent attendance intervention planning. The vision continues to be to access the student well-being teams for our most sort of hard to move, our most stubborn cases. But then in the end, if, if all of those things have happened and we simply have a student who has not been willing to cooperate and collaborate with us, we want to have an accountability measure. And this may be an issue of semantics, but before when we had E3 or loss of credit, you failed the, you know, you, you may have passed first quarter, but you didn't show up at all second quarter. So we can, even though C to E is technically a D, we can go through our process to give you that E3 or that loss of credit. So it may be an issue of, of semantics, but, you know, and, and I actually am meeting with the high school principals on Friday afternoon to sort of flesh this out further. Language that I'm thinking about is withholding of credit. And so we're not failing you, um, but we're not. So again, my example, English 9A, you got a C first semester, first quarter, second quarter, you haven't shown up at all or turned anything in. By our grading policy, C to E, e equals a D, and, and you get a D, you get credit for that class. If we can say, you haven't done the second half of English 9A, and in order for you to get that credit, and then we have a, you know, a vision to work with each of our curriculum offices and say, well, what might that look like in English 9A? What might that look like in algebra? What might like what might that look like in, in NSL? You know, the final part of that accountability measure is we're withholding your credit and we are giving you these three or four opportunities. You know, it could be, you know, online credit recovery, it could be coming in, you know, after school to, you know, or some, you know, a couple, you know, some time, you know, some time during the summer to just demonstrate some mastery of that second quarter material. So again, it's that last part that I'm, we're wanting to work through so that it doesn't just look like E3 2.0. So those, that's what we're looking at. And when will, when will that be available? I mean, when? We're looking to have a proposal for it by the end of March. Um, given where we are, I think implementation would likely be for the beginning of next school year. And it will include, well, may include, 
virtual options because I think what happened is a lot of kids went to work. Right. And with the cost of things going up, they need to stay at work. Yes. So that will we consider allowing non-traditional hours? I, I think, I think we have platform? to. I think we have to. Because, again, we're really about the learning. Then, you know, are you sitting in the seat or not? So if you're mass, like we want you to learn that material and, and take it with you into college and career. So if, if for whatever reason you need to do that virtually with however much support, I, I think we have to let students do that. So in that kind of scenario, is that, um, is that a student who would be going to the virtual academy or just accessing their, their course virtually? I think we want to move away from the virtual academy being sort of a, you know, coming in like a, a revolving door, and we want it to become just like one of our application programs. So I think the answer to the question is it, it would be a virtual option, but it would be supported by the school and helped the coordination of it would be um, supported central off, centrally. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Just a couple questions. One is, um, I don't even know if this is a term, but I would say it, what does the work that you're talking about here with chronic absenteeism, how does it or does it encompass in-school absenteeism? We're hearing all these stories from students, families, staff about uh, you know, like posses of kids that just wander the halls mm -hmm. during class and the, and the security staff sort of chasing them down saying, why aren't you in class? Why aren't mm -hmm. you in class? And is this looking at that information too? Students who maybe they're in school, mm -hmm. but they never go to periods two, five and mm -hmm. whatever. It absolutely does. If you, if you had nine high school or 10 high school principals around the table, nine of them would say, we have a pretty good handle of our students who aren't coming to school at all because of you know, mental health or community issues or things like that. And we have our student well-being teams. The students that we really want help with are those students who are in school but not in class. And so um, in a seven-period day, if you... You know, if you attend 10% or more of the school day, but 50%, you know, 10 to 50%, it's a half day absence. And if you attend 50% or more, yeah, it's a half day absence. If you attend 50% or more, it is a full day of being present. So those do add up and they become the data for students who are chronically absent or not. Okay. All right. Interesting. Because I, yeah, I do know that that's an issue. And, mm -hmm. but then that comes down to the student engagement piece, looking at mm -hmm. just the, why don't you ever go to period two? Right. That kind of conversation to is there a, between the student and the teacher, just mm -hmm. a mismatch that happens right. or some other reason, but that, that gets to just, what are we doing to make sure that what the, the commodity that we offer students in our schools is one that the students mm -hmm. value in. Right. And, uh, and, and your example, if, if they're going one and then three through seven and not two, I think that's a great question for a period, the period to teacher about, you know, what, what is it about the other six periods? What is it about period two and what can we do about that? Yeah. And one of the things, just to piggyback on what Steve said, one of the reports that we built in Synergy, because there was a lot of interest in kind of analyzing this from different angles, is um, principals can pull period by period who's who's not attending what, where, you know what I mean, so that they can drill into some of that data to see what uh, some of the, the hot spots might be during the day or with certain teachers. Yeah, yeah. interesting, um, because I, I do know, you know, that's – and I – and this is anecdotal, mm -hmm. but it does appear that this is, has, is far enhanced post-pandemic, right. this sort of artifact yes. of just the wandering mm -hmm. policies of Absolutely. kids. Absolutely. Um, and then um, one of the things I wanted to mention, um, sure. how are we, so uh, Ms. Wolf brought up the fact that, you know, so, during the pandemic and since with the inflationary pressures on families, some students went to work and they stayed at work because they need to. Making, how are we making those students say aware of an opportunity like TAWS, mm -hmm. which is sort of designed for those kinds of students who, who are otherwise mm -hmm. working, they still have a few credits. How are we letting mm -hmm. them know of that? Because I, I have spoken to a lot of students, and I would say one in 15 mm -hmm. has even heard of TAWS, and fewer than that know what it is. Mm -hmm. So we, we continue to share that information with our counseling teams at the high school and the pupil personnel workers. and. You know, my expectation would be when there is a student who 
you know, as we're digging into why isn't why aren't isn't he or she coming to school, and the answer is work. That we start to look at options like TAWS, um, like um, you know, partial day schedules and things like that. So, I mean, it's a lot of the a lot of the things we talk about at this table. It in terms of we need to continue to find ways for students to learn about this. And so, yes. you know, we, it circles back to student voice. You know, it, you know, if how do we make sure, you know, how do we make sure that our student leaders and all of our students are also um, people who talk about the, the benefits of such a program? Yeah, because I think the, the ideal thing would be for students to proactively take advantage of this, not get into a place where they're right. in somebody's crosshairs because they uh, of attendance or some other reason, but for them to be empowered with the knowledge that this is an option that's available to right. you, if this is something that would work for, for your unique circumstances. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and how do we do that better? And I've just put this out there. Um, I was talking to a group of students today um, for a seminar series at Northwood, and ha just happened to, in the course of the, the back and forth conversation, ask how many of them knew about the student designed reporting app that we're now calling Stronger Student. Nobody. Nobody in that room. And that could be a way. So if we're talking about, it was back to the first part of this, this session today where we were talking about um, incidents and discipline and that kind of thing, having that app as something that a student could use to either anonymously or not describe something that happened to them in their school that day that made them you know, act out, made them not go to class, made them leave the building. But that could be a way that we, using that student-designed, student-centered, student-crowd-sourced app right. as a real resource to help us understand better the student experience in our schools. And I don't think it's there yet. And, you know, students don't even know about it well enough yet. But I, I would just encourage us to look at that as a resource for information gathering and, and, a, and, a, and a way to have a back and forth conversation with our students that feels safe to them um, because that's who designed it and that's why they designed it. So there was this, this safe way for students to speak, um, whether to report an incident or at, seek help or whatever, but it's, that's what it's there for. So just comment. We need, that, we need the link to that app on every school's website, on the MCPS website. We need to be talking about it in all of our spaces because um, I think uptake so far has been relatively slow, but I think it's, a, it's an amazing uh, resource for students. Listen, I think we have come to the end. This was a great presentation. It was sobering to me because I have to tell you, I was very distressed when I looked at the PowerPoint in preparation for this meeting because I think, in my mind at least, it reflects um, the perceptions and attitudes about, the, the numbers we're seeing reflect the perceptions and attitudes about black and Latino students and what they can and cannot do by members of our staff. And I, I mean, that's just the way I feel about it. And you know, this is um, a big issue for us because this year we are focused heavily on accountability. Now, math and literacy are our focus, but you know, you have to be in school in order to receive math and literacy. So I'm very troubled by this, and I'm concerned about being accountable to our public for the funds we have going in to these programs and that we aren't showing the success that we need to see. So I look forward to you coming back in May, hopefully, with some numbers that give me less heartburn. <laughs> and I also appreciate the, you taking the look at attendance that I asked you to take a look at. As I understand that black and Latino students, I think benefited the most from loss of credit. Is, isn't that before? Is that how that went? So no, so so a, a long, many many years ago, on a planet far far away, um, when there was loss of credit, we in the very original group, we looked at what grade was hidden by the loss of credit. Okay. And Black and Latino students were more likely to have a passing grade under that. So they wow. failed the class because of attendance, not because of lack of mastery of the 
the material. That's what I was trying to say. But I, I, I look forward to getting some more information on that accountability model that you plan to set up. And I, I hope that um, you will include some students in that discussion also, because I think that will be important. So that's it for me, I, I, for Ms. Harris. So thank you very much. I really appreciate all that you did to pull this together, because I know it wasn't easy. And I know answering these questions wasn't easy either. But thank you. And we look forward to talking about this again in May and some other stuff, I'm sure. Bye-bye. Yeah. <laughs>